Hi. <laughs> I'm just reading the quote. Well, I think uh, it's a timely one because I'm not sure I'm going to be uh, still the favorite of the fairer sex after this talk because it's going to be a dry talk on mathematics and uh, <laughs> it may cool down uh, any enthusiasm. <laughs> so I would like to thank Royd for this invitation. It's my uh, maybe fourth time here and I'm very pleased to, to share uh, some uh, uh, talk with you today. Despite, again, it's not like an easy talk. If you have mathematics in one talk, usually half of the room leaves, so I'm glad that still you, you're there now. Um, so is there too much mathematics in our specialty? That's the question I had to, to tackle. And uh, I would start to, uh, with those two major scientists. The first one on the left is Gerd Schron. I'm sure you've heard that name. And in fact, I think it's the only ophthalmologist that I know who got a Nobel Prize in medicine because he uh, was the first to publish uh, a mathematical model of the eye. And this has laid the foundation for further major uh, achievements such as biometry or, uh, for example, uh, designing a profile of ablation. This is a Mernerlin profile. You see, it's using a very simplistic model of the cornea, but still it's efficient. So without Gerl Schrand, we would not be able to do IOL calculation or uh, uh, photo ablations. And um, he was a Swedish ophthalmologist, and he made it to the uh, Swedish Royal Academy of Science. And he got to the Nobel Prize Committee. And interestingly, he was uh, in the jury of Einstein here uh, for his candidacy for Nobel Prize. And he voted against Einstein for the relativity theory, because Gerl Schrand would never believe that this was uh, in fact true, that time and space would be correlated and relative to each other. Hence, Einstein got the Nobel Prize, but not for the relativity, but for something which is really of a concern for us as ophthalmologists, which is changing the way light was perceived as now not only a wave or a ray, but also a particle. And because of this work, which was again in the early 20th century, we could predict the laser effect. So Einstein predicted the laser effect at least half a century before the first laser was designed. And uh, as you see now, because of all these achievements in science, and they are based on mathematics prediction, mathematical prediction, we can have femtosecond laser, which are uh, cutting the cornea. Each pulse is 40 femtosecond, and there are 200,000 pulses a second. If you stretch these times, to another scale to better apprehend what it is. It's like shooting for 0.001 seconds every three minutes. And if you would stretch the duration of a pulse to one day, the next pulse would be 70,000 years from now. So it gives you some glimpse of how m wonderful those technology are. But if we hover even higher in, in, in science. I think Galileo was probably the father of modern science, and I like those three quotes because they probably deliver the quintessence of what science is. He says that the universe is written in mathematics, which I believe is really true. And as a scientist, regardless of your level, what you have to do, I think, is measure what's measurable and make measurable what's not so. And also, it's encouraging that he said that even if you think you're wrong, Sometimes, I mean, I mean, if other people say you're wrong, but if you are convinced that you've, you're right in your uh, scientific uh, steps, you should still believe in what you do. And I would now zoom in to my very tiny scale and uh, uh, tell you the first uh, research project that I was involved in. I was, at that time, uh, a young fellow, and everybody was interested in understanding why the cornea was oblate after myopic refractive surgery using this same monolim profile. You see, the cornea is uh, here uh, flat in the center, and, uh, and uh, it goes uh, with a progressive steepening. And this was not very optimal for quality of vision. It was inducing circular aberration. So everyone wants to understand why that. And I was thinking at that time, why, well, it must be because of the a crude monolin profile, which is spherical. So I decided to do a little calculation, and I was sure that if you r subtract this profile to a normal cornea, you would get a oblateness. But when I did the math, I was always finding the solution was that 
the prediction was to a more prolate cornea. So in other words, the mathematical model was predicting something which we never observed clinically. But at that time, I thought I was wrong because my intention was to prove why the cornea was oblate and why it was important to deliver aspheric correction. So I was lucky to meet mentors such as Dimitri Eza, who encouraged me to publish my uh, research in IOVS at that time. And in fact, the fact that Mernerlin profile should, mathematically speaking at least, induce more prolate cornea led to the discovery of the cosine effect, which is due to the declivity of the cornea. So in fact, if we would use Mernerlin profile on the cornea, they would be naturally more prolate. The fact they are not is due to a physical effect, which is due to the loss of fluence in the periphery. And if you discuss with R&D engineers in the excimer laser industry, they would tell you that the departure from the Mernerlin profile in aspheric correction is usually up to 40% in the periphery. So there's a lot of uh, uh, adjustments to take into consideration non-mathematically predicted uh, effects. And uh, I was also interested in to understand better how the laser were working. So sometimes you can use not formulas, but simple diagrams with uh, some uh, softwares to see uh, how uh, correction is delivered on the cornea. And especially this was important for the astigmatism strategies. At that time, some companies would advocate to use negative cylinder strategies because FDA approved the negative seal correction way before they did for the plus seal. It was a bad thing because we modeled at that time that here you can see the uh, depth of ablation was way more uh, dramatically uh, increased when you use the negative seal strategy than when you would use this positive strategy. It's ex exaggerated, of course, here for the clarity, but it's proportionally exact. But not only the depth was more important and increased, we also decided to look what was, and it was published in some journals. But the real question after that was, OK, we go deeper in the cornea with some strategies, but what is the exact impact on the volume? Because the cornea is a three-dimensional tissue. And we decided to address the question of the volume of the photoablated tissue. So we did a simple modeling. It was published also at that time. And of course, you all know the Mernerlin formula, which is shown here. And it's about a third of uh, the square uh, of the optical zone times the correction. But if you do the same kind of approximation, you can find a reasonably good uh, equation for the volume, which is here proportional now to the square of the square of the optical zone. And that's very important because, for example, when you think that you're going to enlarge or reduce the optical zone by 2 millimeters from 5 to 7, not only you will change the depth of ablation, but you will considerably affect the volume. The volume will be multiplied by 4 when you move your correction from a 5 to a 7 millimeter zone, which is maybe not that intuitive for us, but that's exactly true. And ectasia, you know, and uh, all these biomechanical uh, consequences of LASIK were not really addressing volumes until a recent uh, period. And this is maybe my next talk uh, for tomorrow. We also extended this work to all the volumes implicated in LASIK surgery, and there's a paper in press in JCRS um, about that. The second question when you do some mathematical modeling is how to interpret your models. You know when you do LASIK screening and you look at topographies in elevation, you will usually notice that the posterior surface has more red in the middle than the anterior surface, and the question is why that? It has even led to the conclusion that keratoconus could start posteriorly before it can be seen anteriorly. Why not? But in fact, could this be like an artifact or something which is at least a mathematical consequence of the scales we use for a, uh, elevation topography representations? What we should not focus um, out of is that when you do um, a representation of elevation topography, what you show is a residual to any surface you use, and usually we use a best fit surface, best spherical uh, fitting surface. But in fact, when you do exactly what the Pentacam is doing, on an anterior and a posterior surface, which you mathematically model as aspheric surface, and you can see the diagrams there, for the same asphericity, 
the posterior surface will look always more red, reddish than the anterior surface. And this is not because it's more aspheric or prolate. It's just because it's a smaller surface, because it's steeper in the center. And this is why usually the posterior surface is more red than the anterior one. And again, for the same aspherosity, minus 0.2, you can see the anterior surface will be not as red in elevation as it will be uh, for the posterior one. And this is even more dramatic for uh, a larger aspherosity. So sometimes you should not be uh, jumping on the red shift to uh, conclude that there's a keratoconus posteriorly. It's just a mathematical artifact due to the fact that the both scales that are used for the plotting in elevation have the same steps. And it was uh, heavily discussed this morning that if you manipulate spherical aberration, for example, you can induce increased depth of focus. And to manipulate spherical aberration with laser surgery, you cannot really program spherical aberration in a laser. What you have to go through is using the Q value. If you want now to understand the effect on the Q value change on the Zernike coefficient of a wavefront expansion of the cornea, it's not very easy. You have to use fancy mathematics, scalar products, inner products. But you can get those formulas and plot uh, diagrams. And that's what we did in the literature uh, over the last years. And you see, it's not very easy to understand. But bottom line is that if you want to induce a change of, let's say, minus 0.4 micron of circular aberration on a 6 millimeter zone, which seems to be the most desirable one, what you will have to is change the uh, Q value to uh, minus um, 0.6 when it's starting with 0. That is a shift of about 0.6 change here. But what is even more interesting is that when you manipulate the Q value, you also affect the defocus coefficient. And that's the source of huge confusion in the clinical world because it has led also to when you adjust the Q value, you have now to do an adjustment of the sphere. And this is, in fact, all these this things is, the next is a consequence of okay. the uh, model that we, that we are using, which is not probably optimal for ophthalmology, the Zonicky polynomials. And that's my PhD thesis that I sustained last year. The intention is to point the problem of the Zonicky's, which is not a very useful classification for some terms, because again, when you look at this very collaboration here, it has a defocused term inside. So when you manipulate spherical aberration with, for example, adaptive optics, not only you change the spherical aberration, that is the change of the power in the periphery, but you also change the defocus. And this is very confusing. This is, in fact, due to the orthogonality constraint that Zonicky used in his model. But again, it's mixing apple and oranges, because if you have this term, which you think is free collaboration, it's not. It's as much defocus as free collaboration. Coma has tilt in it here. And the uh, sixth order free collaboration has fourth and second order free collaboration embedded. So to overcome this and avoid those confusion between the spectacle refraction in a patient in whom the uh, zone key would predict a myopic error here, we have improved the mathematical model and developed new functions there that are overcoming this uh, problem. Here you can see um, that the new spherical aberration is uh, flat in the center. Here, that astigmatism is, for the second degree, less tormented than the, than the Zernicki one. And also, coma has no tilt anymore in the middle. So what is the change expected in those uh, classifications is that if you plan treatments, you will really be more uh, able to understand what happens in the lower degree range of aberrations here, which will be completely separated from the high order. So if you manipulate spherical aberration, you're not expecting a change in the defocus because there's no defocus now in the spherical aberration. And i just show you an example of a patient who's emetropic and has halos after surgery, myopic surgery. If you do a Zonicky plot, you will see that there's some tilt here, which suggests that you may have decentered your treatment. It also shows 
that's the tilt here, coefficients are high, there's a big defocus coefficient, which suggests like almost two diopters of myopic error. And you can see there's a, l a little, relatively to the defocus, positive circular aberration coefficient. If you use now a better classification, which is more separating those components, that's what you will have. No uh, defocus here. The tilt has disappeared, as expected, because it's an artifact from the Zerniki, and you can see much better the spherical aberration. If we use a vectorial representation of this wavefront, you can see the difference, and that the wavefront, which is the violet one, is much better approximated in the new high order classification than in the Zerniki, because the Zerniki have to be orthogonal, whereas this classification doesn't, doesn't need that, doesn't have this request. Uh, to start with. So uh, I just showed you that when you work in the field, you can still try to improve, although you have always to remember something which has been quoted by a, a famous statistician that every model is wrong, but in fact some may be more useful than others. And on this, I would like to thank you for your uh, kind attention. <laughs>